Hello and welcome to Deep Dive with Harry Turpin. I'm your host, Harry Turpin, and I am so excited that you'll be joining us this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge that wherever you're joining us from, you are on Indigenous land. This show specifically is being broadcast itself on the historic and contemporary lands of Duwamish, Suquamish, and all Coast Salish people. I acknowledge the forced displa displacement of Native communities from this land while honoring the endurance of the Duwamish people who still live here. To this day, the Duwamish people have yet to receive federal recognition. I encourage you to visit the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center in West Seattle to learn more. I'd also like to unequivocally state that Black Lives Matter. Now, a bit about Deep Dive. For those of you joining us for the first time, this is the way it works. I'll be joined by a guest and we'll go through a series of questions. My questions will serve as a guideline, but as the conversation progresses, if my guest says something I'd like to know more about, we'll take a deep dive and explore the topic a little further. And that's pretty much it. There's no gotcha journalism. There's just a chance to get to know our guests a little bit better and talk about some interesting topics. Towards the end of the evening, there will be a Q&A period for you to ask our guests any questions that may be on your mind. I can't guarantee I will get to all of your questions, but I will definitely do my best. You can submit your question either through the Facebook channel or the YouTube, wherever you are watching from. I am so excited to be joined this evening by Aaron Woltz. Tonight's conversation came about at the beginning of this pandemic, and Erin saw so many people in the theater industry being affected. She wanted to do something to help, and so we brainstormed tonight's episode, designed to give some insight into those considering a return to corporate America or navigating both worlds. Erin has worked in human resources for over 20 years in a variety of industries, but is currently the AVP of Talent Management at Symmetra, a financial services company. She's passionate about people and helping them to do their best while bringing their whole selves to work. She's worked her way up through HR wearing lots of different hats, recruiting, HR business partner, employee relations, et cetera, et cetera, and spends her days mostly working with leaders on engagement, diversity, equity, and inclusion as it relates to the employee experience. Erin also has a passion for theater, and while she chose to pursue the corporate route to pay her bills, she was an avid theater performer working at a variety of theaters in the local Puget Sound area before taking a break to focus on her family these past few years. And in addition to all of those wonderful things, Aaron and I are great friends. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Aaron Waltz. Hello, Aaron. Hi, Harry Turpin. Thanks Hi. for having me. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I'm so excited that you're going to spend this evening with me. Yeah, me and, too. Uh, whoever is out there watching. Hello. Thanks for watching, friends. I know that we have just come off the debate. Hi, did you watch? Did you? <laughs> Hi, mom. Did you watch any of the debate tonight at all? I did not. I was working. And then, of course, this doesn't just happen. I had to like <laughs> right. <search a> little. <laughs> do all the magic and, and do did, all the things. I saw some Facebook comments, so I'm assuming it wasn't great. <laughs> it was but, a doozy. It was yeah. definitely a doozy of a, of a debate. And uh, I think I called it a train wreck. Um, and uh, so, right. yeah, it was. And that was probably within the first five minutes. But um, thanks again for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. We do have a little bit of legal stuff that we just kind of need to throw out there at the top <laughs> of the show, which is Erin's appearance here and anything that she says is solely her own opinions and do not represent uh, Symmetra. She is here. She's cleared it with them and everything's great, but she's here to offer her expertise and not as a representative of Symmetra. So we just want to put that out there. So Sounds you... Like so you have a job tomorrow, basically. If you, I, I doubt you're going to say anything incendiary, but you never know. <laughs> that would be awkward to fire myself in human resources. Oh my, that would be really funny. Yeah. Actually, you're like, Aaron, I need to talk to myself about. <laughs> I'm really nice though. So I feel like, you know, if I have to fire myself, it'll be great. It'll You'd be, be the right person to comfort yeah, them, right? Totally. So it would be really good. <laughs> yes. So um, I want to dive in uh, and just kind of get through some of these questions because we've got a lot of fun, interesting things to talk about tonight. Um, give us a little bit of your history as a performer um, and tell us a little bit about how you started. I know that uh, obviously you and I, and you can start with that story, how we met too, but, uh, <laughs> but, but but give us a history of your performer here in Seattle as, as a performer here in Seattle. Yeah. So I was, my parents told me I was singing since I was two. So I've always been a singer. Um, I loved, I was always a little theatrical and d dramatic. So, and I'm very animated when I talk with my hands. And so I've always really um, loved, you know, musical theater. My mom used to watch like My Fair Lady and Oklahoma and Sound of Music when I was a kid. So I grew up loving musicals. And when I was a kid, we played like shows and we would do them in the neighborhood. We would um, in our living room, on our fireplace. And so I, I've always loved to be, um, I loved to sing. And really I wanted to be Whitney Houston along with my sister, <laughs> um, but 
that obviously is not gonna happen. So we, um, so I've always loved to sing and I sang a lot through like high school and did, you know, show choir, jazz choir, all state choir, all the choirs. I did all the choirs and never did anything like musical theater related until I was an adult in my full twenties. And I did my first show in Seattle was Twas the Night where I met you, Harry. And yes, I, I remember, remember well, <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I was like sitting in like church um, at the time and they were talking about like pursuing your passion and like what's your creative outlet or, you know, all the things like to living your best self. I forget what the speech was, but I remember just started sobbing <laughs> and which is a common occurrence actually. And so I realized I don't, I didn't have that creative outlet anymore. At the time I was working like three different jobs. I had rando job at home health agency. And then I had, I was doing this like speed dating coordination I don't know, just something to try. And then I was doing, I was working at a scrapbook studio. So I was doing lots of random stuff. Um, and I decided to, that I broke up with my, I'd broken up with my college boyfriend. I was very cliche. I got a tattoo of a butterfly, even worse. Um, and it was all about like coming out of my shell and like pursuing my passion and trying to do some musical theater because I've always wanted to try it. And I auditioned for Twas the Night. So for those of you who are in the theater world and you know what Twas the Night is, it's basically through a school on for um, Studio East, which is a great, they have a great program. But I remember like auditioning and being really nervous and like, I had to figure out like a monologue and a song. And I just like put like, I think my headshot was some cheesy picture that someone took of me. And so I, it was, I was kind of a hot mess, but they cast me. But then I found out that you had to either sell an ad or pay, I think it was like $50 or something to be in the show. And I didn't know that. And so I think they, they either waived it or I, I don't know what happened, but anyway, so I did twice, or I did twice the night as I was the mother. I was one of the adults. Um, for those of you who are in theater, um, some very famous Broadway stars were in that production. Uh, all the Saunders kids who are now famous and running their own like YouTube channels and doing all kinds of stuff are, um, were my little mice for the story. And so, um, yeah, I did that. I met you and we became like instant friends. We were best That's friends, true. I think week two and just started you really, I think you even gave me a book called Audition. I still have it. And I just, you kind of told me everything you know, basically. And I just try, took it in like a sponge and started auditioning for stuff. And I, I then worked at like Eastside Musical Theater. I did the whole community theater circuit for a while. Well, the whole time. Um, and so I did, you know, Eastside, I did a Vita at Eastside Musical Theater. And then I did a lot of stuff at um, SMT. And then I, you know, I started in like ensemble. I was just happy to be a tree. I didn't care. I just wanted to be <laughs> on stage. And then I started getting some roles. And then I did a few new voices um, cabarets with uh, Brandon Ivy and Contemporary Classics, which has been amazing because I was surrounded by these very talented people who were working, doing this for a living. So I kind of always felt like, why, what am I doing here? Um, and then just kind of kept doing that until I, um, I had a, a back surgery issue and some other stuff, but as much as I could, I did it along with working in the corporate world. And then I had um, Jack, who's my son, who's four years old. And I just couldn't figure out, I couldn't manage both at the time. Right. I, um, so I decided to take a break. Understood. Yeah. And uh, so we're going to share just a little bit for those of you, uh, you mentioned the <laughs> new voices and things like this. This is probably the, I would say probably the thing that a lot of people know you for would be for this particular tune. Yeah. Um, what is the name of the tune? Tell us just like, give us one or two sentences about what this tune oh, is. Oh, it's called the, the Ballad of Sarah Berry. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Lindsay Mendez, is that her name? Uh, saying it first. And she's awesome. Um, and I actually don't really know. Basically, it's about this like high school prom queen who become like she basically kills all these <laughs> girls to become the prom queen that's okay like, in a nutshell. so you know it's a super happy song yeah it's <laughs> super uplifting for sure so we're going to go ahead and share that now you guys can uh, hear a little bit of aaron singing um and uh we'll Definitely. go from there you got your silver syrup, you got your Thank <laughs> you. 
We're just going to let it play out. <laughs> there we go. Nice job, Aaron. How high are you belting in that? Oh, I don't know. I think that one's a G, an A. Oh, is that all? Is that all? I just well, I'm just that like out. screaming because RJ Tansioka was like, can you just go higher? Can you just sing higher? I'm like, uh, <laughs> sure, until I start squeaking. But uh, yeah, and I, that's that's Connor Russell, Ryan McCabe, and then Elise, and I forget her last name, but all three of them are amazing and I love them. So yeah, it was really fun. I will tell you this though, Any New Voices is the most terrified I've ever been to perform because it's one night. If you mess up, you just, it's on YouTube forever. And so it's very scary. <laughs> um, yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. That was Elise Campello. Uh, Ryan Elise McCabe, Campello. Connor Russell, and Elise Campello oh who, gosh, were, who were there. Awesome. And then uh, RJ uh, Tantioco on the music. Uh, he was playing piano, Justin Huertas on cello, yeah. Thomas Dutton guitar, John Van Zandt on bass, and James Pino on percussion. Um, so you, you were working a full-time job as you started performing and you were doing all of these things. Yeah. Um, what was that like? How did you navigate the two? Well, I had no, <laughs> I had no other social life. I was single. Uh, you know, I was in my twenties, so I was a lot younger then. And I think, you know, I never, or I, I knew it would never be a full time gig, or at least that's not. I, I always had dreams of Broadway. Everybody does who gets into this, I think. Um, but I never, knew, I never thought it would be like pay the bills and be my first time job. So that kind of gave me a lot of permission to just have fun and try new things and just have a chance to perform. And I really just loved being able to rehearse. And I kind of liked <laughs> balance is something that I've always kind of struggled with, to be honest. And so I've always had lots of things going on. And so I really liked kind of the hustle and bustle of hustle and bustle. I'm apparently a hundred um, <laughs> hustle and bustle of having, you know, my work day, I would go to work, you know, like nine to five or nine to five thirty or whatever. And then I would like, eat dinner in my car, like most theater people, I feel like. And then I would get to rehearsal and I'd rehearse from seven to 10 at night, drive home, you know, get ready for bed and go do the whole thing over again. Um, and I, at the time, like my jobs were fairly, you know, I was an individual contributor at the time I could come in and, you know, I, I've been really lucky in that I found a job or a career that is really placed to my strengths and I love it. So I love both. I love, I have lots of interests. I, always, you know, I love being able to talk to people all day and help them become their best selves at, in, in the corporate environment. And I don't know, it just kind of, it kind of worked for me to be honest. Um, and so I, you know, I was tired a lot. And I think even what was nice about it though is because I did so many shows that were kind of at theaters where it was, you know, like Village Theater has a run where it's like three months or something. I didn't have any of that. I didn't have, to, you know, I only did like the originals or a workshop. And so I was able to balance the two pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until I got kind of higher up that it was a little bit harder when I started managing a team and that kind of, that that what made it a little bit more challenging. But I, yeah, I mean, I would just try and uh, fit it in and um, make it a priority. So as you, as you are going through your theater career, at some point you decided that you were going to pursue more the corporate path. And you had mentioned that you didn't necessarily ever think that you were going to be on Broadway or that was yeah. going to be a living or career yeah. thing. So was that always the plan to have the, the corporate path be in that direction or were you holding out hope for, for something else? Um, you know, I think to be honest in like high school when I was going into college, I actually, remember thinking I could try and pursue singing as a full-time career. And I remember thinking like, I want to be the best, which is not a thing like in, in theater and the arts, there's, there's, there's room for everybody. Everybody has a unique talent that they bring. And it's so subjective. Like somebody who loves my voice or thinks I'm super talented. Somebody else is like, you're a hack and you suck. So, you know, I think that's, that's a big part of it. And I, you know, my, immature brain at the time didn't think I could do it. And so I kind of put that side away for a while and was like, okay, I need to make some money <laughs> for one. And what else do I love? I love communicating with people. What's, you know, when I was in college, I got a, my degrees in communications and I, I saw that they had human resources as something that you could do. And so I kind of was like, oh, that sounds about something that I would like. I originally though was going to be a wedding planner. <laughs> And, or, or I liked PR or, I mean, I just changed my mind every five minutes. Um, when I started HR though, I really, I really liked it. And so that made me feel like I was doing things that were natural to my skill set. I didn't feel like I was giving anything up and I knew I had to, um, actually, you know, make a living. And so, um, I went, I went that route. So you're, 
you're navigating and you're in the career world and you you have had great success through all of your career. Like you've done a, a bunch of different things and now you're currently the AVP at Symmetra. So first of all, what does AVP stand for? Um, assistant vice president. It's basically like a, <laughs> I call it a mini, a mini executive because technically I'm not part of like management team at our company. Um, but I man, I manage a team of HR business partners who really help our senior leaders navigate like all the people stuff, you know, when someone's not performing or how do you get, you know, how do you set them up for development? Um, yeah. So I manage, I manage that group and I'm a leader within human resources. Our company is about eight, or I guess now we're almost up to 2000 people. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have a team of six, six people. Okay. So yeah. How, as you are ascending the ranks, essentially, through your various yeah. careers and, and to where you ended up, uh, where you currently are, how did some of the skills that you had gained in your performing life translate to the corporate world? Yeah. And I will also say I had some really great leaders. I had, so first of all, my my very first job out of college was a terrible manager. He didn't do anything. So he's not watching. So it's fine. Um, and so I was, it was, people were not happy in their roles. And I remember vowing to myself, like, I will never be in this position again. And as much as I can help other people and do their best work and not be miserable at work, that's what I want to do. And so I got a call from um, Beth Herdlicka, who I still look to today as one of my mentors. And she really supported me and helped me kind of give me the basics um, on like, what does it mean to be an HR professional? Um, how to handle and play relations? She was very transparent. She let me sit in on calls. You know, she kind of taught me everything I know. And then I've had other very um, amazing leaders who have also then helped kind of build that with me. Um, but to answer your question, um, I would say a lot of, you know, performing to me is the same, you know, a lot of the skills you learn performing are the same in corporate or in, you know, in jobs in corporate America. Um, I think about their just like this yes and idea of like improv, right? Where, you know, you kind of say yes and, and, and it's part of listening to somebody and hearing what they say and building on top of that. Um, I mean, I've even used that for my team where they have to kind of say yes and so that I know they've listened to the other person and they're also applying what they've heard. And so I think so much of it, you know, being able to think on the spot um, under pressure. Um, and then I think about just like the discipline and learning and having this kind of growth mindset um, while you're, you know, rehearsing for things or learning something, a new new dialect or a new dance move, like choreography, like you're using different kind, parts of your brain to engage. And I think that a lot of those skills are easily kind of parallel to life in the corporate world. Um, I think about also kind of being a little bit humble and, and you know, taking the note and being open to feedback. Um, and then I will also say just pure resilience um, where, you know, when you're auditioning and you're in that hustle all the time, you're used to hearing, well, I was used to hearing no, I didn't get cast in everything, obviously. Um, and so you kind of get used to like, okay, that, you know, my job is to audition and put myself out there. And if I don't get it, I'm going to go on to the next thing. I'm going to try something else. Um, so you're, you're constantly trying new ways to, to solve for that. And I think that applies to my every day. I'm always thinking of new solutions and, and trying to build on what I learned and, and being open to hearing more about like where I where I have opportunity and um I remember like for theater anyway like talking to you and like RJ Tansioko like people who I knew had kind of you know quote unquote made it for, as far as I was concerned you were getting casted shows that I wanted to be in those theaters and I, I listened to everything that was said to me and I know RJ actually gave me really good advice where he's like ask for help like ask them like hey how did you get to this place what are you doing what do you what should I do and you know what classes should I take um and really helping to kind of start asking for help and, and collaborating with people. And I think that's, you know, working as part of a team is, is another part of that where you're, you're building this show together when you're performing. And it's the same idea where you're working together towards a common goal. Like you're used to being part of that, that team. So I could go on and on, but those are some of the things that I feel like have really, I don't know, help, helped me quite a bit. Well, and you, you mentioned asking for help, which is such a, an important part. And I think that so many people think that they have to do this entire career path on their own without, yeah. uh, without, and really it is truly a collaboration from the moment that you're in the rehearsal room or you're working with coaches or, or doing any of those things. Asking for help is such a huge part that most people don't 
get an opportunity to uh, that don't not even get an opportunity that don't take advantage of that they yeah. think that it makes them weak or something that they haven't earned it themselves yeah and i i'm i mean i'm the first one of those people and I, that's how i grew up i was a military kid you know my my dad was big on you know if you you see a job it's yours you, you, you know you kind of do it yourself and you'd be you know kind of self-reliant which actually served me well for quite you know most of my life um and i was a military kid i moved every you know like year and a half i think as i got a little bit older and i had to kind of adapt quickly so i think you know my my life experiences contributed quite a bit i think to who i am today but you're, you're absolutely right you you it, it's kind of amazing about how how like close close they are erin in the middle of this pandemic that we are currently yeah <laughs> that we are currently we're going to dive right into the things um but Dead in the it. middle of this thing that happened many yeah. of the artists that you know that i know um and love are now without options to make money um doing the things that they do so many people are contemplating entering the workforce again after years of being solely an artist or a teacher or a creator actor performer director whatever that might be what advice would you give to them as they're starting to navigate the corporate world for what could be perhaps the first time? Yeah, I, first I will just say I I have such like a, a place in my kind of a place in my heart for when an entire kind of industry kind of gets wiped out without any warning. There was you know this was kind of un, I, can, we, I know we're hearing in the news unprecedented, um, you know that we weren't expecting this to hit and that this affected a lot of people and kind of where their food was coming from and there's, you know, having to survive in this. So it's not a luxury to be able to choose a new career for some people. They're a little bit like, it's 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 scary. Um, so I think for, you know, for me, it's all about kind of thinking about what you already bring to the table, like in your performance and, and think about what is it you, how can it translate? And, you know, I know that there's a, there's a reality here where you have to pay bills and, you know, I don't want you to have to like sacrifice your soul um, or feel like you're selling out. Um, so how can you find something where you, it's, it's comparable to the skills that you bring. But I will say that a lot of those things translate so well. Like I think about, you know, the yes and that I mentioned, but that ability to work under pressure, um, you know, problem solving, quick thinking, interacting, being able to tell a story and, and you, you know, talk to a customer and relate to a community like think about all those things. And when you're actually applying for a job, like do your homework, prepare just like you would, you know, I'm gonna be kind of cheesy, but prepare just like you would for an audition. You're not gonna go in and, you know, audition for Sound of Music with like an In the Heights, you know, 16 bars or whatever. Um, so thinking, you know, you wouldn't do this, you would do the same thing that when you're applying for a job in the corporate world of thinking about like, if I'm going into customer service and I'm gonna be answering phones, how do I show that I have this ability to relate to people and build a relationship and connect quickly um, or navigate something um, on the spot, which I think, you know, measure or uh, compares to being on the stage, um, working with a team and, and really thinking about like, what's the role? And then also tailoring your resume to show that. So I know you and I have talked a little bit about resume stuff. Um, and I think it's going to take a little bit of work maybe to, to kind of, come out of theater world and go into kind of corporate world and how do you tailor a resume so that you get the call like you want the call back you know you want well, the interview <laughs> well and it. and you bring up such a great point which is like so for those people who have been like i've been an actor for 20 years i've been dancing and singing i've been stage managing i've been costuming how do i turn those skills and break those down onto uh a resume that recruiters and, and job folk who are looking to hire are going to be able to understand and translate. How do they, how do they utilize those skills that are, are really huge and encompass so many other skills yeah. to be able to break that down? Can you, can you talk about how yeah, they can I mean, make themselves, you know, basically translate 10 years of tap jazz and ballet into something a recruiter would be willing to see? Yeah, I think it comes back to what's the job. So if you're applying for, you know, a project manager or look, you know, as you're looking at things that interest you, how are you taking what you've done and apply it and use the words that you see in the job description or the posting in your resume? A lot of this is a little bit of a tip and not every company, obviously, I can only speak on my experience, but a lot of organizations use kind of applicant tracking systems and their um they're able to filter off of code like keywords. Um, so use the words that are in there, use those buzzwords so that they can, you know, they'll find you and be able to look at your resume and go, oh, okay, how are they comparing this? 
What I will say is connect the dots for them. Don't make it hard for a hiring manager or HR or recruiter or whoever who's looking at this. They probably have, and maybe this is an old rule, but I think it still applies, like 60 seconds. Make that easy to read. I can see what you did. And for theater people, I would say, unless you're, unless you're, whatever job you're applying for is a direct like experience that they're looking for. Like you've been a director and they need you to be like in this like client, like Mo, you know, your director of this job, um, you know, I would go skills based. What are all the different skills that you're able to do and start with that on your resume and then go into like your experience so they can kind of see all those different things that you have. Um, you know, I, the job, what I will say this, the jobs that exist that we're hearing now today, there's, you know, all this research about kind of what kind of employee will be successful in the future and that there are, you know, robots are going to take our jobs. And I think that's true to some degree. Like a lot of the jobs that exist today will not be jobs in the future. And what people are looking for now is this ability to kind of be flex somewhat flexible and to have the human element and be able to have the aptitude to learn something. And I think I mentioned that growth mindset of just being open. So how can you show some of those things in your in your experience and you know learning like you said 10 years of jazz like that didn't just happen overnight you took time over years to learn it and to um, hone it and to practice it and i think that you can say the same thing for you know learning a new um technology or to like you know figure out a new process or you know you're just going to bring a different perspective and that's what we're going to be looking for as people enter the, the the working world is just a new skill set you know we don't want people in these boxes so if you've had kind of a broad experience use that to your advantage and you know speak to that a little bit about what's been your experience and how can you tie it to what you know the role is um, because those questions that you're going to get are going to be like, well, tell me about a time when you did go above and beyond for excellent customer service. And maybe you didn't have like a retail job, but maybe, maybe you were in a show where you were working with children and to make it an extra magical moment, you went out and talked to the kid afterwards or, you know, something, I, I don't know, I'm totally making things up, but like, think about what they're looking for and, and find those little nuggets that, that actually make you stand out versus it feeling like you're trying to like square peg round hole. I don't know if See, I answered your question. No, but it does. And and I want to dive, uh, I want to dive a little deeper. Oh, dive a little deeper. I heard um, your intro. That's good. Cool. Yes. Um, <laughs> but let's do it. Uh, so you mentioned the skill-based resume and I, I wonder if there's just a fear for folks because you know, we go, okay, I, I worked at this company from X years to X years and I did X, Y, and Z. And from a skill-based resume, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about what that exactly would entail, but they can take the look at the entirety of their work in the body and be able to say, okay, I was a performer at Theme Park Y, and in that I had customer service relations. I did this. I was working transactions. I was, you know, breaking it down that way. Um, you know, I was working with the team. I was collaborating and all of those particular things. Can you talk about breaking down some of those sort of loftier goals or those loftier experiences into yeah. something that could represent a skill-based resume? Yeah, I think the first, you know, I've had a couple conversations with some theater people and I think the first step is to like not panic because <laughs> um, I think there is, like you said, a little bit of that fear kind of takes over and you're like, well, I don't even know what to do. All I know how to do is play piano and music direct children. All I know how to do is stand up and belt my face off. Like what the hell am I supposed to do with that? Um, and I, I think, so it might be, you know, I can't speak for every position out there, but how you kind of start to, to look at that, you know, Google search some stuff and figure out like, well, what kind of job do you, skills do you need to have for this? And how do you start to translate the two? Um, you know, I think if you're truly stuck, there are agencies out there that you can go and they can help place you. It kind of depends on what you're looking for. Are we looking for something that's just gonna be a stopover for now? Or are we looking for a total career change? Um, and I think that it's, it's it kind of being open to then What's the new role and how do you really go in and, and look at some of the like, what are the requirements and the skills that they ask for? Every job description out there for the most part has a section of like responsibilities and skills and look at those skills. A lot of them will be, you know, ability to be savvy with um, communications. Um, a lot of it will be how do you interact in a team environment and, you know, you're doing that performing every day. So like, what are those things that you do in those moments? You know, you're making quick decisions. You're, you always support your people on stage and you're there with them in the moment and you're listening to them and reacting. Um, you know, I think 
some of those are skills that people don't always have. Um, I'm trying to think what else, you know, it's, it's a lot of the soft skills. Now, how do you break it down? Like really go back to the job description and really look what they're looking for. And then, you know what? Google is your friend. Um, you know, there are a lot of things out there that kind of will help you go, okay, this is what I want to do. And how do you uh, tailor your resume as an example? Um, I think what's challenging is that people have gaps in their history. I think about, you know, um, people who have taken time off to parent children and they come back into the working world. And so a lot of those, are, it's the same kind of ideas. You took time away. Wh where do I start? Um, and so I think, if it, yeah, I don't know if that helps. You no, it does. But 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 it leads me into my next question, really, yeah. which is how do you address that gap? Like if you let's say that at one particular point you were working for uh, um, a healthcare company. Right. And then you decide to go and be a performer uh, and you're performing and you're moderately successful and you're you're getting gigs and things for 10, 15 years. And now life is the way that it is. How do you explain on a resume where those yeah. that that gap is? Do you list and say, you know, I was a performer or or what do you do? do in that particular situation that's not going to basically damn you yeah. um, uh, immediately. Yeah, I think it's a it's a building on top of the other stuff. So if you start with these are the skills I have and then go into like the experience you have. I mean, like think back anything that relates to what the job is like pull it back. If you worked at McDonald's when you were a kid, like, you, you know, work in the customer service and don't put dates in there. Um, you know, just put what you what you were doing and that and and use those kind of um, the filter words that you're seeing in the job description, make sure those are in your resume as well. And then I would say, you know, you can address a lot of this in a cover letter, but a lot of recruiters don't have time to read cover letters anymore. So I, you know, I don't, I, my personal preference is I don't read them. Um, I look for like, what's the skills they have. And then I look to see if it's something interesting that will help apply to the job. Um, so it kind of depends on, on the job. Um, so I would start there. And then, you know, you asked this before too, of like, well, do I say I was a performer? Um, and I think, you know, if it makes sense, yes, absolutely. Like they want to know that you've done something like, if, you know, what, what is it that, how does this apply and why would I hire you? So I think if you've been performing for the last 10 years, you are going to have a very unique perspective as a customer, for example, of what you might need. So I think that that has value. So throw that in there. You know, how can you make that relatable? Um, it, it, you're going to have to kind of go through your own inventory of what you bring to the table and start to kind of chip away. And I think that's the hard part, too, is that it takes a lot of work um, at first, just like you would for preparing for any kind of you know show. Um, but you're trying to get the interview. Then in the interview, you can speak to kind of, you know, the time you took. And frankly, if I'm a hiring manager and I hear that you um, you've been traveling and, and doing theater or you took 10 years to perform, I'm going to be curious about that and say, well, how does that, what do you think, what, what impact do you think you can make on this job? And, and where do you think you're going to, you know, kind of thrive here? That's your opportunity to show like, hey, I've got lots of different perspective. I've worked with a lot of different people. I've engaged with lots of different audiences. I've worked with lots of different elements and can kind of combine and um, handle multiple things happening at once because I'm thinking about these three different things and 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 use that to your advantage. Because if I could hear that and you're telling me that story, it's going to pull me in and I want to know more about you and I want to hear how you're going to apply that then to potentially my job for you. Well, and you bring up such a great point too, which is, uh, so we're in interview situations. I think so many of us are already on the defensive when we go in and we sit across from that table. We're already yeah. nervous. We want the job. So you know, yes. it's, it's such a hard thing. And when a question like that comes, well, how do you think you can make an impact? How does that impact the job that you can be able to yeah. do, it can feel like a challenge and it can feel really much like, oh, uh, maybe I can't. Oh my God, I'm sorry. I was just yeah. stupid. I did wet taste for 20 years, you know? <laughs> um, but, but really it's an opportunity uh, to yes, in that situation and, and really look at it and say, yeah, no, this is my experience is valid as an artist. My all the things that I have done, I'm going to tell you how I can impact that job. And maybe it's not a direct translation, but it's definitely going to make a difference. And here's what I have. Yeah. So it, it's really reframing that question and working as an advantage. Would you I know in the casting world, uh, when I'm behind the table, I always want people to succeed. I want yeah. everybody who walks through the door to yeah. succeed and to have the best audition and the best the best experience that they possibly can have. So that way it makes my job really hard. Would you say that that's the same thing in the corporate world or, or not as much once you get to that interview stage? <laughs> I mean, it depends on who's interviewing. Um, I would say for the most part, yes. I think people want 
you know, they want you to succeed. They, you know, we're trying any, there are some, I will say this, there's a little bit of an old school mindset where there are some managers out there who are trying to like stump you just because they want to see how you react in the moment. So to your, to what you were saying, a lot of it is like how you approach it. If I'm mm -hmm. throwing a bunch of stuff at you and I'm like, you know, um, where do you think you're gonna make the most impact? And you're like, I don't freaking know, but like, let's say you you approach it the way you said, you know what, I don't actually know if what I'm doing is, is, a, is a direct relation to what you're looking for, but here's how I see it. Here's how I would approach it. Here's what I'm thinking is that I've done this, which to me makes it feel like this. And this is, you know, I can't speak to every scenario, but if I was given this challenge, this is how I'd probably approach it. They kind of just wanna hear your thought process. Um, I know speaking for myself, I do want people to succeed because I know what that feels like and you know interviewing sucks it's not um auditioning you know kind of sucks sometimes too because you're vulnerable you're out there and and you could hear the word no that it's the same thing with interviewing um you may not be the right fit and i there's a whole slew of stuff that maybe you didn't have or there was four other people that they did have all the things they wanted and you were missing a couple so they went with the other person it's not because you shouldn't have gotten the job um, but they're a little bit more regulatory. So I don't have, to, I can't choose you because your eyes are too close together or you're too tall to, to fit with this person. They have to have a real reason. Um, so in some senses, it's actually better. Um, but I think it, it, it is all about kind of like how you approach it and how you're thinking about it um, and how you show up. I mean, I think, you know, if you're nervous, it's okay to take a minute. I, I love it when somebody is like, you know what, let me think about that for a second because I'm a little nervous and I'm not sure I can articulate the way I want to. And I'm like, great, take a minute. Love it. Um, so you're saying really be your authentic self, like show up and be your authentic yeah. self in this situation, right? Yeah. Uh, play that moment of truth if we're relating it back to the theater yeah. and, and, and come from that place of strength. Yeah, what's your moment before? I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah no, absolutely. And I think, you know, I can't speak for every hiring manager out there. There are some people out there who really do want to try and make it uncomfortable and they just want to see you sweat and they want to make sure, but that's not the kind of organization where you're going to thrive anyway, if that's, if that's the kind of person who's trying to hire you. So I would say those are probably very few and far between. And if anything, those are practice, like just right. think of them as practice. If you don't get the job, you don't want them anyway, because those people are, but they're probably going to be bad managers. Um, and I think, so I, I would say, on the whole, um, again, sorry, on the whole, yes, we're, we're, we're conspiring for your benefit. And the other thing is I want you to think about is people are thinking about maybe it's not this role, but maybe there's another role. I've, I've, it happens all the time, kind of like what you don't see is like the back end of like all the drama that happens of coordinating all these managers and interviews. Right. And I mean, we're getting like 20,000 applications that we're reviewing all the time. So it's a lot of people to try and suss through. And so when by the time we get to you and, and talk to you, we want you to be an awesome candidate. We want you to like, we want to get new people. And, you know, every company out there is looking for diversity and new perspective. And how do you think like a customer? And so I think if you can translate all that, like you're that that's great. Um, but I also don't want you to get discouraged if like timing doesn't happen fast enough because there's a million reasons why maybe you don't hear anything. And I'm not saying that's, the best, but the good companies will follow up with you and tell you why you didn't get the job, or at least tell you that where you are in the process. Um, but if it takes a little bit of time, don't get discouraged because sometimes, you know, a hiring manager goes on vacation, or let's say they do have an internal candidate that comes out of nowhere and they have to interview that person. And, it, you know, they're trying to be intentional. And, you know, most companies right now are really looking at their processes to make sure they're dismantling, you know, bias and that they're not, um, you know, inadvertently hiring people that look like themselves. People want very diverse groups. And so that's how they're going to get that is tapping into different kind of communities. So do you think that recruiters in general are, are I mean, this might be a simple question, but do you think that the recruiters are looking for artists or, you know, show people? Are they looking for that type <laughs> of energy? People. Show people. <laughs> but are they, are they looking for that type of energy within their environment? Or is it something that they want, but aren't necessarily going out and saying, we're looking for, you know, your best 16 bars or whatever. I mean, we're, you know, we're yeah. like, I guess the, the, the point of that question is, you know, should people still be applying necessarily for these jobs, th knowing that their diverse skill set and their varied background could be a benefit to the company, even if it yeah. might not necessarily be a direct translation? Yeah. I mean, I would say always apply, like do your work and make sure it applies to the job. Um, 
I mean, I think maybe be a little bit more thoughtful that if it's something like if you're applying for like an actuarial job and you have absolutely no <laughs> exams or like maybe that may not be the best way to go, but absolutely I would say apply. And um, I, do I think that that recruiters are actually targeting like a theater? I, I think, you know, I don't even know if they know where you would even find theater people, you know, it's not like they're, they're just posting things to like Indeed that pulls it in. Um, they're, you know, they're posting on LinkedIn, um, like these kind of corporate sites. I don't know if they would ever think to like post somewhere where, where theater artists are, you know, hanging out or, or learning from. Um, that being said, I have heard of some industries kind of rethinking like, well, okay, where can we get some candidates from? If we really are trying to create a diverse pipeline or cast a broader net, what are we missing? And, you know, I actually did talk to one of our customer service managers, who's amazing. And I just said, hey, you know, there's a whole like community of people who, you know, they worked, they do theater, and even they all have side hustles and the side hustles got canceled. I mean, I think about like people who've been really making it work, they were teachers and all of a sudden now they got nothing. Um, and so what can we do for them? How, you know, would you be open to having this group of people to tap into, even if it was like temp, so once theater comes back, would you be willing to have, and then they could come work when they're ready or when they need it, and just kind of like a community, you know, outreach is part of it. And, you know, she was like, yeah, I'm really open to it. Do they want to work on the phone? Do they want to sell, you know, help customers with insurance? I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like insurance. Right. Exactly That's a bigger insurance. question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody, Symmetra is a, man, is a fantastic company, but we all kind of fall into insurance. I don't think anybody's like, oh, I want to go work for an insurance company. But there is something admirable about that, about that work and supporting people in their, like, their best and worst day. And so I can get behind that because it, it kind of speaks to my core values of taking care and helping people. Um, so I, I, to answer your actual question, though, I don't know if they're actually targeting it, but I have heard of a couple companies where I think I heard Affleck is, is actually employing theater people to help with, you know, sm with small companies and with their benefits or kind of doing some account management or something, something like that. Um, and because they recognize that that's a group of people. So uh, people, when I talked about it at work, people aren't like, oh, that's crazy. They're like, oh, that might work. But you have to kind of translate it for them because right. they're not unless they like love the theater and they're part of it. They, sure. They they're like, does not compute. They're like, how do, what do you mean? <laughs> but it's, it's, as you said earlier, connecting the dots for them yeah. and, and just yeah. saying, this is how my experience is yeah. relevant to this yeah. position. I mean, I think about sales, mm -hmm. customer service. I mean, you know, theater people have to sell all the time. They're selling right. themselves. They're, they're selling a part. They're playing a character, you know, a character. They're telling a story. They can pull people in and, you know, engage them. Yes, absolutely. So, so let's say that, somebody goes through, they do the work, they put in all the stuff, they finally land that interview uh, with the company. Yes. Um, what types of, so, you know, in the interview situation, you're always asked, tell me a story when blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's How, called behavior-based interviewing. It's a thing. Behavior-based interviewing. So, <laughs> so they're in the behavior-based interviewing and they're like, tell me a story when you saved a child from a burning building or yes. whatever. I mean, that's a very specific example, but tell me a story when you felt you made the most impact as a leader. Okay. And so that's the question that comes across. Um, it's obviously specifically tailored to their work experience, but how do, how would you as a recruiter or somebody as a general, as somebody who's sitting there listening, I know you're not a recruiter, but as somebody who might be doing interviewing, mm -hmm. how would you take it? If somebody shared a theater experience uh, shared it, I know you mentioned that yeah. you would be really interested in that, but is that a story that they should omit or mm -hmm. is it, uh, something that they can definitely draw on to be able to further the, yeah. the process. I think if it applies, absolutely share it. Um, you know, what I, <laughs> would I give an example that, Oh, when I was in theater, I wasn't paying attention and my mic was on. And so I said a horrible thing over the speaker, which may or may not have happened. We're going to talk about that in just a second, but I want um, you to finish this story. I was fully underneath the stage. I, was I know, I know. Okay, anyway, I know, no, um, but so I we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute because yeah. it's so one of my favorite it, stories ever. Yeah, if it's a story that like does not show good judgment, or you're like, oh, and then like I was getting changed, uh, like backstage dresser, and I was, you know, in the moment, and my boot popped out. Like obviously, that's probably not the best story to tell. It's gonna make the person feel really uncomfortable. Um, that person's gonna talk about you at dinner when they go home to their families. So don't share that. But if you have, you know, example of when you know, you have a great story about this where your mic goes out 
you're in this huge theater on tour and you're like, okay, so you figure out I have to use my diaphragm and project and use all of the theater tricks I've ever learned so that this whole house can hear me sing this song. And like you did everything it took to make it happen so that you could kind of preserve the Annie magic, right? To those kids watching the show. To me, I'm like, that's inspiring as hell. I want to hear more from you. So I feel like if it applies and it's a good story, yes, absolutely share it. But if you're just telling some weird story about how like, or like you missed a rehearsal because you were driving late in traffic, like they don't want to hear that. That's not right. helpful. You right, know? right. Yeah. Right. So uh, before we move on with uh, another question, I just want to ask if I have your permission to tell this story because it's a little Did bit punching. As long as you get it right. Yes. As long as it's punching out. I will tell my experience and you can you can fix it. Were anything. you there? I was there. So okay. I was home for those of you listening. I was home and Aaron was performing in Children of Eden at SMT. And I think you were playing a chorus member at this particular point. Or you had you had played Mama Noah in the first, first act. Half, no, first half of the show, I'm like ensemble number two, but I okay. played all the like bit parts. So like I had like all these random solos and I was part of the tree, which is like a five part harmony. Yes. That talks to the state. It's like this, <laughs> my, fr my friends call it like the damnation show. <laughs> okay. I love it, but that's fine. Um, so yeah, I had like all these random parts at the beginning and then second half I was mama Noah, which doesn't do anything until like the 11th show or 11, 11 o'clock number. And I think the scene was act one, if I'm correct. Right. <laughs> oh, it was act one during a prayer. Yes. So, so they're doing the show and they're all doing very lovely jobs on stage. Um, but it's a matinee. The crowd is pretty quiet. Um, and they finished this prayer, which is this beautiful, solemn piece. And they all sounded lovely. And I think probably because of the, eff the efficacy of the piece, the audience didn't applaud afterwards and they didn't clap. Now, the show continues on the ensemble, the, the folks on stage leave I'll and tell you why they didn't clap, but okay, go ahead. Okay. But so the ensemble leaves and they continue on with the scene and it's this very heavy, serious scene that's happening afterwards. And we get maybe about 20, 30 seconds into the, the, the scene and I'm sitting there watching it. And all of a sudden across the loudspeakers, I heard what kind of crap version of children of Eden are we doing? I knew instantly that it was your voice instantly and i'm sitting right in the middle of like row j and i was like oh no oh no because i can't stop laughing at this particular point i'm i'm like literally crying and shaking my body is convulsing as i'm sitting there going oh my god that's the funniest thing i've ever heard because it was it wasn't like a muffled and you were like oh no. did i did i just hear that it was plain as oh. day Everybody yes. heard what kind of crap version of Children of Eden are yes. we doing? So I had to get up and excuse myself from the theater <laughs> for the next 10 minutes so I could go outside and laugh and cry and get it out. Yeah. Now, I want to know, tell everybody what actually happened as to why that happened, because well, it was amazing. Two things. First of all, it could have been so much worse. For those of you who know me, I say the F-bomb all the time. I could have said something way worse. <laughs> Second of all, I was... so. We sing, the reason what, what prompted it is that we're the tree and we have to do this like bum, 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 like this weird, like. It was Mr. Sandman. It, they added Mr. Sandman yeah, into. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> yes. That's another reason why they're like, this song isn't even in the show. What are you doing? <laughs> um, and it was like a build. Like we somehow had to like build our notes and I don't remember right. the notes, but I just remember that like something in the piano was a wrong note or I was wrong or someone was wrong. And it was like, somebody hit the like note and then we were kind of like messed up for a while on that. And so, but keep in mind, I am like stage right, no stage left. And I have to go back to stage right to go downstairs or left, whatever I'm doing house, house, right. I have to go downstairs and I have, I'm like a two minute, like I was downstairs for like a good, well, it was a considerable amount of time, 40 seconds. My mic should have been off. And it Absolutely, was it should have been. And it's off. not like something you can you can't turn it off either. Like that's the other thing. Like you are trusting, and the sound people were amazing. Like I should not say that's their fault, but um, I can't turn it off. And so yes, you heard my 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 loud. Now I will tell you, Ryan McCabe and Kat Ramsberg, who in the theater world you probably know them. I don't think they have ever forgiven me because they're literally these two little children are praying to God about how um, forgiving them for what they've done or whatever at the beginning. And you hear my voice. So it was not my finest moment. <laughs> could have been worse, but not my finest moment. Yeah, it could have been. I mean, you could have yeah. dropped an F-bomb in the middle of that, but it was. And if you know me, that's probably what I would have known. Sorry, mom. Um, it yeah, is my. <laughs> 
It is one of my favorite theater moments of yeah. all time. And I will tell that story all the time when people talk about mic failures. I'm like, oh, wait, I have a doozy. And it's not even about me, but it's <laughs> it's one of my favorite. Mostly yeah. just because you call it the crap version of Children of Eden. I know. Like, I mean, like there's a regular one and then a crap version. A crap version. Well, you know, we, I, it's not our best work and we knew it. And so it was really frustrating. Um, yeah, I still get people every now and then, you know, I haven't done theater in like forever, but every now and then someone will be like, oh, that was you? <laughs> Well, yes, that's my. That was me. That is my welcome. claim to fame. Sarah Berry yeah. and crap version of Children I know, of Eden. Two polar opposite of things, right? But it's amazing. It's amazing. It's your legacy. That's what oh. it is. It's your oh, legacy. That's my legacy. That's rough. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I, you deserve better. <laughs> um, All right, we're gonna get back to uh, some questions here, but um, one of the things so. What advice would you give to somebody who is navigating the corporate world for the first time or or after a long time? Like when they go back, what advice would you give them to be successful? Yeah, I I, I even wrote down some notes on this, but I will tell you, like I, I struggle with this question a little bit because let me just acknowledge that it, the world is very heavy right now. And you add a pandemic, which is not easy for anyone. Then you add like people are dealing with remote learning. People are still being, you know, some people are single and trying to like figure out what it means to be alone during this time. Some people are changing, you know, are changing careers and, and an industry that they're just trying to like figure out like, what the heck am I supposed to do? Like, who, who am I? Who am I? Right. And that's that's big. And there's social injustice. And, you know, we're, we're going on an election and uh, you know the debate was tonight. There's so much going on. And so what I would say, and this is going to be a little woo woo maybe, but like give yourself permission first and foremost to grieve and like, it's okay that you're not okay. And that you might have moments where you're like, this sucks. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm really frustrated. Um, and I will say like, that's okay. Like take that, figure out a way to practice like some kind of self care to take care of yourself with your mind, body, soul, and just like do some, you know, emotional wellness and try and surround yourself with people who are going to build you up and not tear you down. Cause this will be hard enough. So I don't know if that's too, too much. Um, but I will say ask for help, you know, um, you know, if you're not sure, go to Google, like I said, reach out to some people who might be doing hiring. You can email me or send me a, a you know, a DM. So people, the kids say now. Um, and then, you know, be, don't, don't despair, I guess. Like, um, know that you're awesome and you're going to bring something to the table that nobody else has. And if you don't get this thing, you'll get the next thing. Um, and keep trying. It's the same idea as when you're auditioning that maybe you weren't someone's cup of tea and, and that's okay. There's plenty of stuff for everyone. Um, and also, you know, if don't like, don't beat yourself up, I guess, you know, like be kind to yourself. Um, that's like the, you know, we're, I think we're our own worst enemy sometimes. So, um, you know, just try as much as you can surround yourself and, and, and try and center yourself so that you can focus on the right stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really helps you. Every, all the theater people out there are like, what, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> But no, I think yeah. I think that it's really really good uh, advice. Is just to remember to 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 treat yourself well, and you know, like it's a process, and it's not yeah. going to happen overnight. And if you can be kind, and you can be remember that it is a, a process, and you're navigating new territory, it's going to be a lot easier to to make it through for yeah. sure. Um, I, I want to dive into this final question. And for those of you who are watching out there, we will be getting to some question and answer period in just a moment. So if you have them, think about it and you can put them in the comments and I will read them. But really, this is kind of the big question. And this is this is this is my gotcha question. Just oh, kidding. Right. I, I promise. No gotcha I know journalism. I promise no gotcha journalism. Me. But can you tell us about the affair that you had? No, I'm just kidding. Um, oh, easy. I never uh, okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, the big question we are artists. Uh, we all have hopes and dreams. We want to reach for the sky. We want to win the Tony. We want to be the star in the show, yeah. movie star, world famous director, actor, whatever that might be. With all of those stars in our eyes, taking a corporate job could be looked at by many people as though we were selling out and that we're giving up and we're giving fuel to those people who basically said you were never going to make it anyway. Yeah. How do you, how do you, what do you say to those people who who might be taking that like taking that corporate job or coming home or or leaving the city to to find a different place um and feel like they're giving up on those dreams what what could you say to those folks 
Well, I will say, well, first of all, don't listen to anybody else because, you know, I think for those of you who know title of show, like the vampires, they're going to they're going to feed on when they know they can bring you down. So forget those yahoos. Um, I would say. You didn't get me, but I, I knew you were going to ask me something along these lines. Um, I think it's possible to have more than one dream. I think it's po I think it's still um, I think it's still okay to have dreams that and give that give you a sense of purpose while also recognizing that we have to put food on the table. We have to put a roof over our heads. We have to like support ourselves and there is nothing wrong with taking a step back or taking a step over because I also think you never know what's going to happen next. Like you just don't know where where life's going to take you and maybe you'll still go where you you know down that same path. There's no wrong age or, um, you know, level of person you have to be to, to be able to perform. Like who knows, you could still end up going to Broadway if you want. So, so I think dreams are what help continue to motivate you. And, you know, maybe there's still an opportunity to put that to work. I mean, I think about like, I haven't performed in like, I don't know, seven years now, I want to say it's been a while. Um, other than the like shower concerts I do or the, you know, I sing to my son, obviously, but those are songs I make up because I can never remember lyrics. So whatever, um, you know, there I, I'm able to facilitate trainings all the time. And I kind of view them as mini performances sometimes where I, I have to try and engage large audiences. And maybe I'm not singing and telling that story in that way. And I'm not artic I'm not expressing myself in that way, but I'm finding other ways to express myself. And I think about you know, there's some people out there in the theater community who are just finding new things during this pandemic that they didn't know they had a passion for. I mean, I think about like you're, you're kind of like doing all these amazing things, Harry, where, you know, you're doing, you know, deep dive pop, you know, webcasts, you're doing, um, you know, trivia nights on, on Thursdays and, and finding that you really enjoy it. You don't know, you might enjoy something that it just changes then your perspective and, um, could lead you down the right path anyway, or give you a new skill you didn't know you had, and then you can apply it to theater anyway. I think about like becoming a mom and like this, how that has changed. Well, it has changed me probably to my core. Um, and how, like, if I were to go back into theater now or try something else, I would have such a unique perspective and it would be so much deeper if I were to play a role where I was in that, like, you know, mother and ragtime, let's just say um, that. <laughs> put that out there, um, that I, I would have a different, like how I would come into that role because I have that life experience now. So I don't want to be cheesy and, and also don't want to be so like pie in the sky that you're like, that's not real. Um, but you just don't know that like, it could lead you down a road that could be really powerful. And I think, you know, um, being open to a new experience or trying something new, like doesn't make you a sellout and it doesn't make you like someone who didn't who gave up on your dreams. It makes you a person who's growing and learning and will make you further along than anybody else. And so I think, you know, I think what's hard is that you feel like you're giving something up and that thing will always be there. Like those things will always, those skills, like, you know, we might have to like rehearse a little bit, but it, it's, it's somewhere inside of you and, and there's a passion there and there's a creativity there that it will just be worked in a different way. And that might actually make you even a better performer when we all come back or when, you know, it might shift in a, in a different way. Um, you know, or you might even create like a new product out there that we didn't know we needed for people to help. I think about like education and how we've got all these people like remote learning and these kids where we're trying to engage them. And the and the teachers who are being successful are the ones who are kind of being a little, you know, crazy and animated and, and trying new ways to engage those kindergartners. And maybe there's something that, you know, theater people come up with a way to to change that. I mean, I, I don't I I think anything is possible and being open to that um, while also still being grounded in like there are some real things you have to be able to do um, to, to provide for yourself. And to me, there, there's no shame in that. Uh, and, you know, it's it's really the opportunity of of um, like you mentioned so many times before is just yes. Ending that. Right. Just yes. Ending the the situation of being open to it. it. It's not so much that your dreams have to stop being your dreams. They can still yeah. be your dreams, but you can move forward and, and be open to that experience and, and take that on into whatever it is and, and give yourself permission to, to continue to still dream and, and see where that does take you. I think that's really, really great advice. Yeah. Um, 
We are about to a question and answer period. So if you do have a question, go ahead and pop it into the, the comments. Or if you just want to say hi to Aaron, that's fine too. Um, I'll give some compliment. How many people are really like, is there anybody even there? Am I, even talking I think, to yeah, there are some folks watching. If you're watching, uh, some comments are popping up. Uh, but definitely, if you have a question for Aaron, go ahead and pop it in there. Um, Aaron, I'm just going to do some while we're waiting for a question or two. And just so you know, sometimes questions don't show up because I'm such an amazing interviewer. People are like, wow, you covered that. You're so thorough. Um, Yes, but, oh, but or my answer was to, so bad. They're like, yeah, don't ask that question. Okay. Tuned out. Bye bye. No, but I do have some rapid fires for you while we're waiting for oh, any okay. questions that may show up. Uh, what was your last practical purchase? A lamp. Okay. What was, what's practical? your favorite? What was that? Is a lamp practical? Sure. It's absolutely. absolutely. Oh, I'm a liar. It's baskets. Um, I'm obsessed with the home edit on Netflix and I <laughs> bought new baskets for our closet. Lovely, lovely. Uh, fall or winter, Aaron? Fall. Okay. Uh, Thai or pizza? Pizza, please. All right. Uh, what's your favorite website to visit? Um, is Pinterest a website or an app? It's a, it's a, it's a website. Yeah, it started oh, like a Pinterest, probably. Okay, we'll go with the we'll go with the Pinterest. I have a no bummer rule, so I really try not to look at things that are going to completely like. Of course, I'm trying to keep updated on the sure. events, but I really like to. I don't know. Pinterest. All right. Process. What is your least favorite word? I already know this one, but go for it. Oh, you know what it is. It's moist. <laughs> moist. Unless uh, you're talking about bread, I don't want it, or like a cake. I don't want to hear it. No, no other places. What was your first boyfriend's name? Adam Horner. Australia. Oh, hey. Shout hey, out. Adam Horner. Hope you're doing well. Uh, What's side your... note, I snuck out to meet him. My mom was watching. I got in so much trouble and we did not, like, we literally talked. I was in like seventh grade. Oh, Very it's sweet. so innocent. So I know. sweet. We like met in the moonlight. He was weird. That's fine. Um, bye, Adam Horner. Um, uh, what was your last extravagant purchase? <laughs> we bought a piano and then returned it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, RJ played the crap out of it. We had a little mini sit just for those of you watching Harry and RJ, a friend of ours who you saw in the last couple deep dives. Um, and my husband and I have like our own quarantine and we, um, we did a little sing along one night and it was awesome. But then like the piano kind of broke. So anyway, that was it. And then I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's extravagant as I get, I think. It was a good night making music. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, what's your favorite swear word? Can I just say it? Absolutely. Uh, that would be fuck, my friends. Fuck. It's a good swear word. Uh, what is your favorite right, thing Jack. about? What's your favorite <laughs> thing about Jack? Oh my gosh! My I know there's so many things. For those of you who don't know, Jack is Jack is Aaron's son. Um, I will say <laughs> there's a lot of things. I, I a lot of things that um are really fun to discover about him. But I would say he has a really good like sense of humor. Um, and kind of gets things that I would assume he wouldn't get, but he does. And so it really make, it makes me laugh. That's awesome. We do have a question that came in oh. from Eloise. Eloise asked, oh, can no. either of you hey, share no. how you think your theater experiences are helping you cope during COVID? Great question. Um, well, I will say doing anything creative has kind of helped. So like the way that I kind of apply it is in a different way. Um, so I will, so when this first hit, uh, first hit, when the pandemic hit, um, the first month was really hard. And part of that was Jack was home with me. We couldn't go anywhere. I was also trying to work from home. And so we implemented um, daily dance parties to help. So that was a little bit of like just a creative outlet. Um, and also got us our bodies moving because I, I don't move all day because I'm sitting at this computer, right? Um, and then we, I would say like for, I know there have been some theater people out there who've been doing like readings over Zoom. I didn't, haven't done any of that kind of stuff, but just having, um, playing games when I can with my family, doing puzzles, I think, you know, using my brain in different ways. Um, I think the tools though, to answer your question, Eloise, um, a lot of it is around like, for me, my biggest one has been showing gratitude of for where I'm at and kind of putting myself in a place where I can think like what is going well right now and writing those three things down in my calendar every day. Some days it's just being grateful for coffee and some days I, or they're bigger, but I find that that has kind of grounded me the most. And like in theater, I think a lot, you know, I don't know if gratitude is really the thing, but like centering yourself or finding a way to kind of like focus on what you're trying to do and going kind of inward, um, has really helped because if I'm, I, I tend to be so kind of aware of the around me, I have to kind of 
create that time for myself just so I can focus. I don't know if that answered your question. What about I you? Think- you do? Um, you know, I think that you mentioned it a lot before, but it's really kind of the yes and situation. I feel like um, theater is just a series of crises, really. It's uh, so from true. from the beginning of auditions yes. to tech and, and performance and a button goes wrong and, you know, it falls off or whatever. And so you're always constantly managing as things are popping up. And I think that that has really helped to, to stay on top of what's coming up. And it's like, okay, this is new. I don't understand it. And there are going to be hard days just like there are in, in, in doing shows and things like that. But you're like, I, I got this. I can get through this. If I can survive hell week, I can get through anything, essentially. Yeah. Right. So um, so I, I think to your question, Eloise, it's really just been being able to roll with the punches and being able to understand that as things are coming along, that you can yes in it and go, OK, this is new. How do I deal with this? How do I adapt? Um, yeah. You know, and and but also part of it is really to your point from earlier about trusting and feeling like you're selling out or trying to find new things. It was really about finding ways to be creative and having that, putting that outlet out there for me. For myself, it was creating this web, this webcast and hosting reboot represents and, and, and things like that, where I had an opportunity to perform in a sense, but also still feel like I was giving back. And, And that's really what's my motivator is how can I help connect people and how can I bring people together? So finding a way to bring that to the forefront and making it work within the pandemic is really what has happened, uh, to help make, help me cope through this entire experience. Yeah. I think too, like not taking yourself so seriously. Like I, I kind of, I bring that to my work style a little bit too of, you know, what, what are some things that are making us like laugh right now? And so like mm-hmm. in my company, we, we did a meme off for HR, which um, was kind of fun. And, you know, I, I'm kind of the one who's always like, let's do something fun because everything's so heavy and we're already in an industry that's kind of like, Ugh. like, how do we bring some like levity to it? Sure. Um, and so focusing on the positive is helpful. You know, there's a reality, obviously, but how do you kind of escape and, and use your imagination? And, you know, Jack and I would make up stories and um, for a while when it was nice, we were pirates and we were going to dig for treasure. I looked for treasure probably like five nights in a row, I think back in, in June. Um, and so really trying to use kind of some of those, you know, improv skills or, or kind of, a, you know, being an actress and trying like a new role or whatever and, and being kind of larger than life with, with my kiddo because we have this time together has been huge. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got a couple more questions here from Mr. Brian Sproul. Oh, Brian. Uh, hey, Brian. Hey, Brian. Uh, Brian says, what missed opportunity has motivated you to get back the opportunity lost, either professionally or in a business or professionally in theater? You may have stumped her, Brian. Yeah, way to go. Thanks, bro. (laughs) Uh, This opportunity has motivated you to get back to the opportunity lost. Can you think of a time when something has shown up and, and it, it flew by you and it's now motivating you? It's lit a fire for you. And Brian, if that's not how we should be interpreting that question, <laughs> please, please correct us in the comments. Um, I will sure. say, so professionally, I don't think I've ever had something where I feel like I missed an opportunity because I've, I feel like that would drive me crazy if I was like mm-hmm. thinking about all the things I missed. Um, but I definitely learned early to kind of pay attention. And like, if somebody asked me to take on a project or try something, I, you know, if you see a job, it's yours. I'm like, oh, well, can I try it? And I might fail miserably at it, but I want to kind of see what happens. And because I've been so willing to kind of take things on or try and figure it out, I think that actually has served me very well in my in my professional career. Um, for theater, I'm trying to think if there's been something like, I oh, you know, sure. Um, when I, (laughs) this is kind of embarrassing, but go for it. I remember auditioning or like, I got like one lead role and all of a sudden I was like, I'm not going to take anything but lead roles and was surprised when I didn't get called back for something because I was like too big for my britches because I wanted to, you know, do the show. And it's because I was, I think it was actually you Harry, where you're like, I'm not taking ensemble because I don't have, it, it, there's a reason for it. It wasn't, you weren't being self-centered. It was just cause it wasn't worth it for you for the pay or whatever. Um, and I remember thinking like, Oh yeah, I'm going to do that too. And then like, I have no basis for that. I don't even have like, I have like three things on my resume and I'm in the process of building my resume. I have no reason <laughs> to think that I can come in and like call the shots around what roles I will accept. So I think that was like a more of like, maybe not a missed opportunity, but it was a lesson I learned um, cause I, I didn't get to do the show. And that show actually would have done, would have helped me later on in life probably. Um, the fun thing is 
I got to do the show. I was the narrator. It was because it was Joseph. I got to be like the lead for the lady. Um, and so it all came full circle. But I don't know if I'll, have to, I'll keep thinking on that, Brian. I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, if there's a thing I can think of, I truly like what made me come back to it. I think honestly, since I had so much time between like my like child you know my my, ch my childhood and into my adulthood where i i missed all that time where i could have been making music my life actually might look completely different had i gotten over myself earlier and just tried it and instead of trying to be the best and just do it because i enjoyed it um you know and I, I do believe that if you're called to do something things will happen it will show up um mm -hmm. but you kind of have to meet it halfway like the, like you know, I believe the universe is kind of conspiring for your benefit, but I also recognize there are some realities in the world right now that make it hard. It's hard and it's not going to always just like show up for you. But I think there are things you could do. And like, like you said, like being open and trying something different and like, oh, that didn't work. Let's try something else. Um, will serve you well. So I, hopefully that answered your question, Brian. Yeah, that was a, that was a good answer. And you were great in Joseph, by the way. Um, and I apologize if I um, led you astray by saying, I'm only taking lead roles now. Oh, no, um, it's okay. It was a good, like I said, it was a really good learning moment. I mean, I think um, it, it's humbling, you know, anybody in this business and, you know, Brian actually is a camera person. So I, I, I know he, his life is a little bit different, but he's in that like space too, where he's in the gig economy. He has to kind of hustle a little bit for, you know, his work will speak for itself. And then it's like all who you know and how you get that work. So I, he's a little bit in that now I know. Um, and you know, all that stuff is really good learning opportunity. Um, you're going to make mistakes. And I think, you know, asking questions or watching people who are doing it well and seeing what they do and learning from them has been a big, you know, I think about just like all the people who in like, especially in Seattle who are just amazing performers and also just so humble and they just listen when someone tells them something and there's no, they just like how they handle it. You're just like, I want to be that person. And I feel like I've been really fortunate to be surrounded by some of those people. And, um, you know, I think about that in my career too. It's just like kind of knowing who you have and how can you use them to help you and, and be open. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Now it's just like a Brene Brown speech. No, that's all right. That's dare greatly, Aaron. Dare greatly. I know. I had to work pretty Brown in somehow because she's like my role model, but... <laughs> Um, we have a question from Raymond. Raymond says, how does one manifest a creative outlet in a corporate environment? Yeah, um, I think sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's not. Like, um, for example, you know, um, it shows up sometimes in the, in the smallest of places. Um, like in my company, we have, like I've mentioned, or Harry mentioned that I've been very focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, and we have an inclusive diversity council and we have, um, a group of um, employee resource groups who now we you know we started with like one and now we have like seven and they, last year they did a diversity fair and they actually had a choir sing at the diversity fair and i didn't do it because i was going to be traveling in japan so i wasn't able to be participate and i just think about like how vulnerable they were it was kind of amazing to do this in a corporate environment but it was people who all love to sing or played in a band or played music and I, I was kind of nervous for them because I was like, oh, please, people be nice to them, like hold them, you know, like hold them in your hearts and 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 kind of cherish that they're sharing this part of themselves with you. And I remember looking around at people just being kind of like amazed with it. Um and and just really appreciating their like telling and just sharing that in a different way. So I think you just never know. I think about like me when I facilitate trainings, I feel like I get to perform all the time. Um, I even get to do some of the event planning that I thought I would, you know, in my past lives, I was able to, you know, handle college recruiting events and going to college career fairs and putting on these like large interview loops where I got to kind of play, you know, do logistics and set up tables nicely. And, you know, my, um, my last manager at uh, one of our my jobs was really into having like kind of larger events and she would make it amazing. And so I got to participate in that. So you just never know where you might need to help create something. Um, you know, I think about like PowerPoint presentations and adding some like flair, um, which I know is not exactly what like you do, RJ, but um, you just never know where it will show up. And I think especially if you're working like for me and in insurance, like sometimes that's people are kind of it's unexpected and so it's really like cherished almost um like when i say i do theater or when i'm a part-time theater person you know they're very interested in that because that's not in their world at all so i think there's yeah. a lot of community 
No, and, and, and I want to just uh, share an experience. So I started a brand new job right before oh. pandemic time started, uh, literally five days before. And uh, what I found is that if I could just authentically be myself, it naturally would come up that I did theater and, and that was just a thing. And now what has happened, and my team is small, granted, it's very, yeah. very small, but but now we'll be doing readings and stuff and like the CEO will just call on me to read it in my best French accent or whatever it is. So like they're utilizing different ways because they're recognizing that that is a part of who I am and what I bring to the table. Yeah. Um, and I, so just capitalizing on your story a little bit having the ability to to just really be your authentic self in in the space is really what's going to help you to be able to manifest that creative outlet i believe yeah. i um, think a couple people i think even like evan had to do some uh like voiceover work for like a training or something mm -hmm. and i know like there are people out there who actually get paid for that but sometimes when you're in the corporate environment they'll use you for free um and so i've done a couple of those where i got to do like a brain shark training where you hear my voice and I definitely will never be a voice actor, but it's kind of fun to try that. You know, yeah, for sure. for sure. Uh, we have another question from RJ. Brian, I see yours and we'll follow up with that in just a moment. Oh uh, but RJ says, in theater, unique think is paramount. Corporations encourage following the fold. How can one navigate? Mm. You know, what's interesting is that I think that is true for a lot of organizations. And what we're finding is that that group think is actually preventing us from reaching a drive, you know, a a vast array of 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 I'm trying to say customers, and so that diversity of thought is actually now something that people are really looking for, and I think we're fighting ourselves a little bit. Like we we say we want it, and then how we treat people when they come into the organization that we we kind of fall into our old habits. So I, what I'm seeing is actually people really shifting and thinking about like what is the employee experience coming in? How do you show up as your true self, and how to not squash that so you have to fit into this mold um you know i think there's always going to be some things that you just really can't get away with in the corporate environment but i think things are shifting to be honest and i think that that unique perspective is what you know we're talking about and i think like even in like my organization um you know it used to be that like if it was in your purview like if you were hired for this thing you had to do it yourself and now we're finding like what that does is it kind of cuts off a whole other group of people who might have a different perspective and you might forget something um, or you might miss something or you know we're trying to create products that reach a larger um, group of customers versus just keeping people who are wealthy wealthier you know and so how do we reach a broad group of people will you have those people be on the teams that help create the product um i think you know one of the um like the adages i heard at a inclusive diversity conference was that they were talking about apple and how when they were innovating the, the iphone they, they kind of cut out a whole group of people and they, I don't know if what the statistic is, but a group of, of people that were left-handed and it's because they had nobody on the development team who was left-handed. So I think that's going to be a whole new thing. And I think about like new products, like I've even talked about this, like, okay, I'm trying to think about like a persona customer. What about those people who don't have a steady nine to five who work in like an art you know, industry and they need support, but they don't need, they need support at like two in the morning after their show's over or they need a job at, or something they need to be able to like, you know, coordinate their lives in a different way. How do we support them? So I think actually you might find that it will come in, more organizations are moving in that direction where they will start celebrating more of like the individual versus this like corporate culture of norms. Um, but I will say it still exists a little bit and people are trying to figure their way out of that. Great. Um... Uh, you said something earlier, and I just kind of wanted to circle back, and I'll give everybody a chance to, if you have any more questions, to go ahead and put that in there. Uh, Brian, I do see your question. We will get to that in just a moment. Um, like, what's your philosophy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but you you mentioned something in terms of uh, selling out and giving out your dreams and everything. And really, the, the whole idea behind tonight's podcast, our webcast, was really around making sure that artists are taking care of themselves financially and, and things like that. And um, I'm wondering if maybe you could just speak a little bit about... And, and this is a whole evening's worth of a topic in terms yes. of financially um, yes. taking care of yourself and, and what you can do. But but for a lot of people, the decision to go back into the corporate world from the arts is really about money. It, it comes down to that money. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about marrying the two so that way you are still creatively fulfilled as well as being able to make sure that your needs are met. And, and I know that you are not a financial advisor and I know that this is a question that was not prepared yeah. in any sort of way, but but just in terms of taking care of oneself or, or even in the process of interviewing, 
um, how that might look and, and making sure that you are set up for your future. So that way you could return back to the arts if you wanted to. That's so, a big question, I know. Big question, um, but I, I, I love a big question. I will not I will not shy away from hard conversations, that's for sure. Um, so let me see if I, I, I'm not trying to lose my train of thought, but I will say what I have found is that a lot of people in the theater don't even think about finances, and it's for two reasons. One, they don't value it because they just are thinking, I just want to create art and, you know, show, I just want to be my best self and, and and perform and not have to worry about like the future. Um, and so they're not really set up for success. And then I think there's people who are very focused on money because they're living paycheck to paycheck and not knowing how to get out of it. And so how do you save a little bit and how do you think about the future while also focusing on the present? I mean, I, I am not the expert for sure. Um, but I think you're always going to have to like give something to, you know, there's always going to be an exchange or a change of balance of sacrificing something like, or prioritizing. So like, for example, like if you're really not, if you're not able to put food on the table, like to me, that's a matter of survival. Like that's where I would put my focus and then build off of that. Doesn't mean it goes away and you don't get to do theater or pursue your creative pursuits. I mean, uh, obviously, ideally, you would be paid for those creative pursuits. That's kind of the dream, right? And if you're called to do it, you would be able to get paid for that. The reality, though, is I'm not sure that's always how it lines up. And I don't, I'm not saying give that up. Um, but I think you have to be a little realistic about like, where are you at in this moment? And how do you provide for yourself and think about that and adding that creative to it on top of it or, you know, kind of like maybe later? Um, I don't know. That's a really hard question. I know like for finances, <laughs> I've had this conversation recently um, around like, how do you prepare? And if you're like, or if you're in debt um, or, you know, how do you kind of use that to um, prepare for your future? And, and what are you, are you using the tools that are out there to help you get out of that? And, and like I said, plan for your future. One of the things that you and I've talked about too, is like, let, you know, let's, we're going to go ahead and assume that you rocked the interview and you get the job. Um, this is a small tip for me always negotiate the offer. Just always ask for at least 15% more, 10 to 15% more. The worst I could say is no. And I would say in every situation where I've ever told somebody to do that, nobody has ever rescinded the offer. So they've already just spent all this time looking for you. They found the right candidate. I will say, don't make the mistake that I did one time and like accept the offer and then negotiate. But if you get the offer, like ask for more or do the work to figure out like, what does that really mean for your world and say, Hey, you know, I've, I've got some goals here. I'm trying to reach, you know, is it possible to go to here and see what they can do? Um, it never hurts to ask. Yeah. Advocate for yourself, advocate for yourself. We're, we're, uh, we're good promoters in the arts sometimes and talking about ourselves, but sometimes yeah. we forget to translate that over into, and yet into our real life. Worth sometimes is so wrapped up in that validation. I think that for sure you are look. Yeah. So, I, I mean, please don't like go to a book. Like, Aaron Wold said I should ask for more money, but I would say like, you know, you're worth it. <laughs> like you're right. You bring something to, like I said, you bring something to the table that nobody else has. And like you were chosen for a reason. You bring something there. Um, always, I would always ask. And I would say, and nobody told me that like, no, no one. I just, once you start recruiting and people ask, and, and to be honest, it was mostly men. I was like, well, what am I doing? I'm the poor schmuck over here, not asking for more money. I'm going to start asking for more money. Um, and I would say while they don't, maybe they'll probably meet you halfway, like from a negotiation, like they might, you know, if you ask for like 55 and they're, you know, they come or 60 and they originally offered you 50, they might come to 55 or 52, 500. Like it's closer than what you would have had. Um, or, you know, ask like, what's your potential earning? And think about, and I know I'm getting into like financial advisor stuff, but if you truly are going down this road, think about like, what are the costs of benefits? Do they offer it for free? Like Symmetra, little plug, free benefits for a certain tier of, of, of our individual contributors. So it's like, I think that the threshold is up to 90,000 and it's, don't quote me on that, but it's free, we pay for your premiums. So like, look, think about like what the cost is of that and, and really think about like, you know, what, what is, how does it all add up? And there are lots mm -hmm. of ones out there, but what I find is like, I talk to theater people and like, they're like, I don't, uh, I don't know what to think about it. And you kind of have to at least, you know, especially, specifically if you're getting to a certain point where you are trying to figure out your life or you don't have a, an option anymore, you should be looking at that. For sure. 
Uh, we've got another question from RJ. Uh, he says, besides skill need, what are the top three qualities employers look for in candidates? Yeah. I mean, this is based off my own personal opinion, but what I look for is a flexibility. So like, how do you approach things? You come in with like that growth, like I said, growth mindset. Are you willing to at least try and figure it out? Um, and help connect the dots and, and take it a step further um, and own something from like start to finish or at least understand how all the pieces fit together and really be open to learning more about it. Um, I would say, you know, uh, resilience is something that they're talking about a lot kind of in my in my world around like employees have to be resilient and how, um, you know, they can bounce back or how they deal with like kind of stress and um, having those tools to like get you through the day, especially when like life is hard and then you have like all these things thrown at you. Cause like, there's always so much going on. So I would say that's a big one. Um, in my world, you know, from a leadership standpoint, I, I'm always looking for like, how are you creating space for others? Um, like how, you know, how are you celebrating or, you know, from an inclusion standpoint, like how are you building other people up? Um, because I kind of feel like, you know, I, I have a little bit of like what they call the Saturday test. Like would I work with you on a Saturday, you know, if we had a big project, but I'd be willing to work with you on a Saturday. And the answer is no. Then I, then I have to prove kind of like my gut feeling of like, why, like, where am I seeing that? And I have to kind of get evidence when I'm interviewing you. But if you're somebody who like, I feel like you'll show up and just figure it out and try, and maybe you don't have all the things, but you're willing to learn it or you're willing to figure it out. I will take the chance on that person every day um, over somebody else who I feel like is not interested or is just kind of resting on their their title or their you know their laurels, so to speak. That's great. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for yeah. sharing. We are coming up on time. There is one more question that I'll put up just because Brian did ask it. He oh said, God, "What Brian. epic play has your friend written that needs to make it out into the world?" <laughs> oh my God, Brian Sprout is obsessed with Tabby McCracken. Oh my God, like obsessed. Oh, well, my dad was actually thinking about getting a dog at one point, and naming him Tabby McCracken. So wow, that's know. a trademark. So please yes, pay so. me a royalty yes, for that. Uh, <laughs> Tabby McCracken saves the world is the show that Harry wrote, and I believe it's we like. Don't need to talk about it 15 different iterations um there's a really fun part for a large curvy girl <laughs> with a big not curvy i just made her curvy because i got to play her <laughs> with a melty song big melty that's song that's not how she started that's that's it um so uh, we are coming to our time here, Aaron. I really want to thank you for, for sharing all your thoughts and, and everything like that. Uh, for those of you who are listening, thank you for sharing your time uh, with us this evening. Um, I will be back for a uh, deep dive uh, at some point in the future once I land myself a really fascinating topic and I'm working on that right now. But you can find me watching or you can find me hosting Reboot Represents October 5th. Go over to Reboot Theater's page. Uh, before you leave mine, make sure to like the director's page as well as my YouTube channel. Channel, that would be great. Uh, this is Harry Trippin for Deep Dive reminding you to trust yourself to be yourself. We'll see you next time. Thanks.